know, I've been quantifying my body for a long time. I talked here 2014 and um, uh, 2016, I think. In fact, last, just last year. And this is uh, all of the, this is 70 of the 250 or so blood and stool biomarkers uh, that I track over time. And you can see the red ones, which are immune and inflammation. And um, this is how I collect my data. Uh, actually, I do it every month, but that's a bigger draw on the quarters. And the whole idea was to try to understand, because I spent 30 years doing relativistic astrophysics, how the human body as a dynamical system actually works. And the way we do it in astronomy is you do time series. So these are time series for my blood of your inflammation, uh, complex reactive protein. And you can see that uh, when I was first here in 2014, there has been this big spike up to 27 times normal. Um, and I started taking, uh, trying to understand, well, what in my body was causing this inflammation? And by going to stool samples, I was able to uh, track the things like lactoferrin, which are an example of when the white blood cells are attacking the walls of your colon. Um, I was 124 times the upper limit for healthy, which I thought, you know, was a little concerning. I didn't really have much in the way of symptoms, and it was a little difficult to get the doctors to take it seriously. But because I'm a scientist, I could just go to the literature and find out that you can't get something like lactoferrin that high without having an autoimmune disease. Uh, and so I had active uh, inflammatory bowel disease. I didn't actually know that I did, and I was at that time 60-something. So um, it was kind of a surprise. But what we did, and this is already five years ago, is I didn't know you could do an MRI movie, but I've spent a lot of time in MRI tubes since. But you can see that uh, in the <laughs> lower right, that black thing is not working very well. Um, and so that's where I narrowed it down to, was a part of my sigmoid colon. And because in my institute uh, at UC San Diego, Cal IT2, we've been in the vanguard of virtual reality for three decades. Um, and uh, so I uh, got my, I said to the radiologist once I got out of the tube, okay, give me my data, 150 MRI slices front to back, took it to Jurgen Schultz, who's our VR specialist, and he turned it back into the 3D that, you know, you are. Uh, and furthermore, that part down there, the colon, I could take that and send it out to a 3D printer we heard about earlier, and I actually held the thing in my hand, so it's about here, that was Not anymore. Uh, driving. Yeah, well, yeah. I was this, wondering where your colon is This is the dear, dearly departed. We're going, that's the, um, it's no longer in me. Uh, thanks to Sonia yeah. uh, and Catherine. So, um, so actually when I was here last year, I had just found out in the 16 that uh, by taking a full body CAT scan, that uh, when you actually zoomed in using a virtual polynoscopy. So the way to think about this is at the other end of the GI tube from the mouth, they stick an air hose up and then they inflate your colon. And everything was good everywhere except that one little place where there was essentially down to four millimeters uh, of uh, diameter that everything is trying to get through. By then, I really did understand I had symptoms. Um, and so just a week before uh, uh, exponential medicine last year, I went to my doctor, uh, who's head of GI at UCSD, Dr. Sanborn, said, um, I think I need surgery. I need to get this out of me. And he said, well, you know, we're not sure. And if so, says, but if you're going to do it, Sonia uh, Romamorthy, who's the head of colorectal surgery, is the one to do it. So I had gone to talk to her just a few days before this conference last year, um, and well, how'd that go? <laughs> so, you know, in all of my surgery training and in the 16 years after, nobody's ever, I've never walked into a room where someone had a PowerPoint presentation on their disease process. <laughs> so I walk in, middle of a clinic, running late, and, and Larry says, do you have a minute? And his laptop is open and there's a PowerPoint presentation waiting for me. And so there's the information on the stools for numbers of years and the symptoms. Uh, and this amazing picture of his colon, right? So I was captured there because how did he get all this stuff? I, I would love to have this for every single patient that I take care of. So 
I said, Sonia, I need an operation, and you are the one that is going to carry it out. Usually I'm having to convince people, so, <laughs> you know, this was new. Um, and um, she, once she saw this, this is what she said, this it, is perfect. It's perfect. Okay, so that Not a ended problem. that discussion. You need surgery. <laughs> and I said, but you know, maybe it's a geek thing, but I love you, you're a no great surgeon, but can we have a robot? Um, do the surgery, because I really would like a robot inside me if we're <laughs> going to be doing this. Um, and little did I know that literally less than a week later, I come here and Catherine, get, you know, uh, at Intuitive Surgical that makes the Da Vinci robot, gives this fantastic talk and her fluorescent dye and everything. She says, yes, I must have this. So I stalked her down <laughs> to the show floor and I walked him and says, hi, you don't know me. And then I took this picture of her in front of the new... Uh, da Vinci XI, which uh, is uh, it, the, the most advanced and optimized for colorectal surgery. And I said, you see that plastic uh, hemisphere there? That's got to be my belly. And by the way, we got to get this done in uh, less than a month and a half. <laughs> so when we were talking about this later, I said, let me go find the original email that I wrote to pitch this internally at intuitive because I was thinking boy this would be an interesting opportunity to work with a patient and a surgeon on being able to do some internal visualization so let's see so I wrote Larry Smarr one of the most quantified human beings on earth the world knows more about this super super tech geeks stool samples than we probably should it's still true <laughs> Yes, he sounds a little kooky, <laughs> but he's smart and articulate, astrophysicist turned computer scientist, professor at UCSD. We have an opportunity to work with him and his medical team to do some pre-op 3D fusions for his DV surgery. So interesting or 10-foot pole territory? <laughs> Is this something that we're really going to do? And so we were really quite interested in this. Um, we had been thinking about ways in which we would fuse 3D images of, from the pre-op into the console so that surgeons could use this. And, and so we thought this sounded very interesting. And within a couple of weeks, we had an engineer down in Larry's care meeting, actually in the sort of the joint care meeting. And during the surgery, uh, one of our folks came down and was present during the surgery and actually took some of the videos and shots that you'll see. Yeah. So currently, I'll just say, in surgery today, when we're going in the operating room, I'll just have a 2D image of someone's MRI or their CT scan, like a little and lab. we're operating based on that. And so, I, you know, it's been in our field in, in computer graphics for 25 years. We know how to take a stack of, of CAT scans or MRIs and turn it back into 3D volumetric. What we did here was within the last two weeks before the operation, I said to my virtual reality guy, Jurgen, I said, look, we need to segment out the organs. You see how my colon doesn't go straight across and down, it goes up and down and up and down, and that pink thing behind it is the spleen, which the radiologist could see it had fibrously attached to. So when I uh, said to Sonia, Sonia, here, take this out of me. <laughs> Well, you had to pull down that much more to replace that eight inches, so she now realized that she was going to have to actually have the robot uh, way up here where my spleen was instead of just down here where she would normally do it. Um, so I said, you know, Sonia, you're a great surgeon, and I know you wait till you get inside and figure out how it's going to work, what, what, how each of us are individually different, but that's kind of messed up because I've been giving tours of the inside of my body in 3D for four years <laughs> and you don't know about that and I'm going to be under anesthesia and you're going to have knives in me and I can't tell you. So why don't you come over to my cave? How about you come over to my cave? <laughs> and look at my colon. And look it's at my colon. Concerned. <laughs> I was a little concerned. And this is not, this is size matters. This is like a six or eight foot That's my colon. running suit I'm wearing, as you'll notice. So... I said, Sonia, the thing I'm most worried about is where is point A and point B that you're going to cut and then take it out, right? 
So then, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of this came around to consenting Larry for surgery and talking about all the things that could potentially, the risks, the benefits, where are you going to divide, where are you going to cut. And really, when we started having that conversation is when he said, well, let, let's, let's go to the cave and take a look. And going in there was really an amazing experience because looking at that 3D reconstruction, changed exactly how I think about what I'm going to do in the operating room. And then I was there with Jurgen, our virtual reality expert, and said, hey, listen, it's not enough for me to just see this colon. I want to see the landscape around it, because when I'm in there, I'm worried about the blood vessels. I'm worried about the nerves. So let's fill in this aorta. Let's fill in this in vena cava, and let's fill in this spleen, and show me where the kidneys are. And poor Jurgen's writing all of this down. He has about 24 hours to get this done. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so in virtual reality, <clears throat> That's where we actually made the decision as patient and doctor together where to make the cuts. Uh, and this was individualizing the surgery. So we were, uh, we have a new billion dollar hospital at UC San Diego, the Jacobs Medical Center. This was the first colorectal surgery with the Da Vinci robots in that facility. Um, and the thing that just amazed me is that Sonia was willing to not only willing to take this technology into the operating room, she drafted Jurgen, Dr. Schultz, into, says, you have gotta be in there with your laptop and your GPU so you can just move the visible area around and thanks to Catherine, you could just plug it into the Da Vinci. He said, well, what cable am I gonna use? I said, Jurgen, bring all your cables. You know, <laughs> he did. come on, it's me <laughs> on the table, right? <laughs> get, you know, let's get with the program, right? So, um, and, and then, you know, like Trenton Tarantino, I, I, I having, orchestrated this whole thing, I needed to, I just wanted to have a cameo, so I appear as the belly, <laughs> um, because the, the UCSD Health Communications got so excited, they put a whole HD video crew in for the whole five hour operation, um, just to take it. And then the other thing I learned is, is thanks to these robots, um, nobody's looking at me. Um, <laughs> I mean, not that I knew, right? But, but since I had five hours of, of video, um, I learned a lot. So Jurgen could come in and then plug it in, and because of the beautiful Tile Pro technology in the Da Vinci, you can just have four, up to four different views uh, simultaneously. And so he was able to plug it in, uh, and you could turn it around, and then you had the view from the camera as well. Um, and then the team was watching. And what? How did you think it? made a difference to the team. So, you know, normally you have anesthesia doing the anesthesia thing, and I'm, I'm in a teaching institute, so we have general surgery, residents and fellows, and we have medical students in the operating room, and we have nurses in there. And then we had, I'll call it Team Larry in there as well. Uh, and normally all these people are focused on their individual task, right? I'm, I'm the one that's focused on the patient and what's going on, but they're doing all the things that are necessary to help me. But I would tell you, for once uh, in the operating room, I had everybody captured on what we were doing, and I think it's because they finally, with this, and with what we were seeing on the screen in 3D, could finally completely understand what I was doing with every single operation that we were going through. And as I'm talking, and I'm, I'm normally kind of iterating every piece of the operation, every step that we're going through, people are actually able to see this and, and understand exactly where I'm at in the colon, exactly what the next move is. And it was an incredible team experience to sort of capture the minds of, of everybody in that moment. And they were very excited about Larry's case. And so while you think people weren't paying attention to you, really you were everyone the was paying attention well, to you. Well, and so I grabbed a little bit of the HD video, and this is actually how she was doing it in the real OR. We've released all of this stuff, so we're going to divide right at that rectosigmoid junction, right at the bifurcation where the bowel is laying on top of the bifurcation of the aorta there. It's exactly where we're going to divide the bowel. So uh, that was November 29th last year. And I'm going to bring you back um, to how this all worked out. I, I will say that one of the neat things is this is my uh, GI doctor. He, uh, uh, Sonia, texted him to come in and do the colonoscopy to look at the um, uh, anastomosis, the, the Connection. staples that mm -hmm. they did to link it back together. And at the same time, the Da Vinci robot was looking at it from the outside. So you had the inside and the outside view at the same time. Well, the real question was, was this going to make any difference to my inflammation? And so I just updated this uh, 
to, that's two weeks ago, the last data point. This, I have the same graph you saw originally, except I put it on log scale now. And so what was up at 1,000, it's now down at a one half, which is where the, they can't actually detect it. So effectively, the surgery removed this one part, which was inflamed, and as a result, um, I've been basically completely normal. And it was one of those rare moments where the particular inflammatory bowel disease was restricted to just one area, uh, it's about eight inches of, of, the, of the sigmoid colon. But it's pretty remarkable, and this time series is what lets you actually track it. Now the real question is, can we take this one-off prototype and make it available more widely? So Catherine, why don't you show them what you got? Well, so uh, one of the questions that Larry had asked when we first started playing around with this was why on earth would Intuitive Surgical be interested in coming down to his case? And let's see, let me get this so that, good. There you go. And we'd been working on things like this, being able to give clinicians the ability to visualize with a segmented organ in their viewer, but also a, a service that would allow them to segment for a particular patient and then be able to download it to the Da Vinci. So this is an example. It's not available. It's not cleared yet, but we're hoping to have it in clinicians' hands in a reasonable amount of time. And you get to, I, I've just got an iPad here that I, through the magic, I've got it on the, uh, uh, on the tether. And this is not a real, I mean, it's a real patient, but this is not her real name. This is not a big HIPAA violation here. Um, this is, but this is our example. And this is not Larry's colon for similar reasons, but this is a kidney cancer. And I can pan around and I can look at the collecting system and I can look at the parenchyma, but I can also do things like, well, what would happen if I, when I take this tumor out, what is the bed of that tumor going to look like? Um, what do I have to worry about in terms of how I am planning this surgery? And if I want to look at really just uh, what I would see there, so as I'm speaking and demoing at the same time, I can see that I would have to do a primary closure on the collecting system, and there's some big vasculature that I need to worry about. But that other than that, that is actually a pretty clean removal of a tumor on that kidney, because it's, it's really just distorting the body of the kidney. And so these are the kinds of things that uh, we are hoping to be able to provide to surgeons so that it's not just under the auspices of a a little clinical trial that we did or a study that we did where we crazy got together in a short period of time and managed to bring all of these teams together, but something that could happen more routinely. So like you've got my DICOMs, can you make that of me? I can. Let's do it. <laughs> uh. We already know a lot about your colon. Yes. <laughs> There's always and you're going to know more tomorrow morning. We'll know more tomorrow I, morning. We're yes, going to we tell can. you what happened to my microbiome uh, during the surgery, during we before and after, which has never been done before, too. Um, and, and so, Sonia, I mean, th this is crazy. It's a public-private partnership on the fly, totally stimulated by the existence of this conference and the chance meeting of Catherine and me. Uh, uh, just a week after I I'd met um, Sonia. In fact, Sonia, this is the first time you're actually meeting we Catherine just face to face, twice. right? This Even though you've been working back and forth with her. Amazing. It's, it was virtual up until now. Absolutely. And real is better than virtual. <laughs> so, so what were you guys thinking? Why did you not, well, so why I, didn't you push the little button for the straitjacket people? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I think surgeons want this. Who doesn't want more information on a patient that will do anything to improve the safety of an operation and improve the outcome uh, of a patient? And so the reason why, I mean, you may see that there's 3D out there for many different organs. The reason why the bowel is so different is because it's constantly moving, as you can see. And there's stuff going through it and and so it's really hard for the imaging to happen but when it happens it provides an incredible amount of information for us and and being in that operating room pulling it all together like we did uh, and then sitting there at the console someone asked the question you know could a surgeon ever be replaced by a computer well you think about it as i was sitting there i was looking at 
the robotic view that I had. I was looking at the three-dimensional view that I had. I had the laparoscopic view on the outside, and I had an intracorporeal or an intraluminal view from the colonoscopy. That was a lot of information to have, and I was thinking to myself, the surgeon of the future is going to have this plus a heck of a lot more information to integrate in the moment to completely react uh, in, in the most um, positive way for the patient's outcome. And so that's probably going to take um, more than just me to make right. that happen. Well, and I got to say, as a patient, uh, it, you know, it's sort of the dream team. You know, I mean, this this just came together in a way I'd never really had any right to hope for. But I think this whole new sense of the empowered patient working with the doctors and with industry and so forth, it maybe is a model as we really talk about patient-centered medicine um, for the future. And I would say that that was really the, you as the patient were the center of this yep. and why we were both willing to move in that direction and look at a collaboration like this and figure out how we would move forward is it was really you taking control of your care. And, and so, yes, this is an excellent model for, for patient-centered care. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.